So that intro made me really happy because I'm Ethiopian, and in America, I tell everyone to say my name as Saran Yitbarik because they can't really say my name. And that's the right way to say my name. That was the authentic way to say my name. So thank you. Thank you so much. That feels wonderful. So I'm here visiting all the way from San Diego, California. Uh, really, really excited to be here. I think our flight was, what, 25 hours? Uh, so this is really special, and I'm really excited to be here. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, I am Saran. I am, I'm so sorry. I'm Saron. And I'm the founder of Code Newbie, the most supportive community of programmers and people learning to code. And today, I'm going to tell you a story. Three years ago, I was interviewed on my very first podcast. Show of hands if you've heard of the Ruby Rogues. Show of hands, show of hands. Oh, a lot of you. Wonderful. So the Ruby Rogues is a show that's been on for many, many years. It's a panel-based interview show. And I was on episode 159. And it was called Hacking Education. And the idea was to tell my story of how I learned to code, how I got started. And so I'm telling my story and I'm explaining how I used to be in startups, then I taught myself to code, then I went to a boot camp, then I worked as a developer. And in the process of telling that story, I mentioned in passing how I feel very privileged. And this panel is made of four white men and I look like this. I turn into a cartoon when I do a podcast. So when I said this, one of the panelists, David Brady said, it's so interesting that we have a guest who's at four or five levels of intersectionality who's just claimed to be privileged. And that comment stuck with me. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out where people get their success from and how they become developers, how they become uh, speakers. And I have my own podcast now called The Code to Be Podcast. You should totally subscribe. And we've done over 150 episodes over the past two and a half years. And we interview people who are just getting started. And we interview people who've been programming for 20, 30, 40 years and are very, very experienced. And the goal of this show is to ask people the question, how did luck, how did privilege play a part in your own story? Where did you learn to code? Do you have a computer science degree? Did you teach yourself? What, what is that journey like? I also produced my own conference called Codeland. If you're looking for an excuse to visit New York City, there you go. We have one happening next year. It's our second conference. And it's a lot of that same technical storytelling, taking people at very different levels of expertise from different backgrounds and asking them, how did you get here? How did you become so successful? What is your story about? And a big part of it is really understanding that journey better. So what I found so interesting about David's comment to me was that when he thinks about privilege, he thought specifically about race and gender, which usually means he's thinking about racism and sexism, which are very important issues in many industries, but definitely in tech. Uh, there are a lot of examples where these are still problems. And one example that has always stuck with me is the story of Jesse Frazzle, who's an amazing developer, absolutely very, very technical, great speaker, amazing community leader. And she used to work at Docker, now she works at Microsoft. And she being a very public figure in the container community especially, uh, would receive so many death and rape threats that the company hired private detectives to protect her. That's huge. She wrote a blog post that said, ever since I started speaking at conferences and contributing to open source projects, I've been endlessly harassed. I've gotten hundreds of private messages on IRC and emails about sex, rape, and death threats. People emailing me saying they jerked off to my conference talk video, you're welcome by the way, is mild in comparison to sending Photoshop pictures of me covered in blood. I wish I could do my job, something I very obviously love doing without any of this bull crap. However, that seems impossible at this point. She finally tweeted when she left, she said, I lost something I loved so much and a small piece of my soul standing up for myself and I just don't know if it was worth it. And that's really sad. That is really, really sad. It sucks for her, but it also sucks for the rest of us because we lose people like her all the time. So when you think about privilege, the way I think about it is the ability to engage in that type of behavior or pretend that it doesn't exist because it doesn't affect me. So what does this mean? It means that there are tons of capable, passionate, hardworking people who want nothing more than to be part of this industry and contribute to all of us, but they are being denied the opportunity or slowly pushed out because for reasons that have nothing to do with their technical abilities. And we all have to pay the price for that. But there's good news. 
we are getting better at addressing these issues. And I want to highlight a few people who've done some really good stuff in this, uh, trying to solve this problem. One is Coraline Ada Emke, show of hands. If you've heard of Coraline, show of hands, show of hands, show of hands. a couple of you, okay, great. Well, after today, you will all know more about this awesome woman. Uh, she created the, con the Contributor Covenant, which is a code of conduct for open source projects. It basically says, let's all be nice to each other. That's kind of the, the short version of it. And it has been adopted by RubyGems, by RSpec, by a bunch of uh, different open source projects. And it has really started the conversation on, yes, we all need to obviously be technical to do open source, but we should also pay attention to how we treat each other. Another example that I really like is Tracy Chow, and she wrote a blog post called Where Are the Numbers? And so in the US, there's this huge conference for women in tech called the Grace Hopper Conference. Happens every year. And when she attended in 2013, she noticed that everyone keeps talking about this problem, but there were no numbers. There was no data to support any of it. And so she said, we see visually, anecdotally this problem, but if we don't measure it, if we don't have a number to point to, then how will we know if things are getting better or worse? So she started collecting data. It was very simple. She started a Google spreadsheet, and she invited companies to contribute and to offer their own uh, demographic information about their employees. And she ended up getting over 200, maybe 300 different companies to volunteer their, uh, their information. And eventually, I think maybe a few years after that, uh, Facebook and Google and a bunch of the really big corporations were finally pressured into releasing their own numbers as well. And so she really started a data-based, a number-based conversation on gender problems in this industry. And then my last example, which is one of my favorite ones, is by a woman named Isis who was an engineer at uh, OneLogin. And she was one of four engineers who were selected to be part of a recruiting uh, marketing campaign. And so her and three other engineers, there were photos of them and ads uh, all over the, the subway system and you know, on walls and such. And one person took a picture of one of those ads and in the comments mentioned how she didn't really look like an engineer. And this did not make Isis happy. And so she started a social media campaign with the hashtag, I look like an engineer. And she invited women from all different backgrounds all over the world and different industries too, to take a photo of themselves, use the hashtag and show that there isn't a way to look like an engineer. You either are or you aren't based on your technical skills. So going back to David's concept of privilege and his comment to me, it makes sense that he focused on race and gender, especially when he looked at me, because that's really how we talk about privilege in tech. But I don't like that definition. Because I'm a woman, I'm a person of color, and I'm drowning in privilege. One of the big questions we get in the Code Newbie community is, how do I get a job as a programmer? I've been learning on my own for months, sometimes years. How do I break in? How do I get that first job? And the most common answer we get, shouldn't surprise you, it is contribute to open source. It's easy, you can do it. All you need is internet access, some knowledge. You can do it on your own time. You don't have to ask anyone's permission. It's a really, really great way to demonstrate your abilities and get your first job. But what does it really take to contribute to open source? The first thing is code. You have to know how to code. One of the popular pieces of advice we give to newbies is we say, you know, if you're nervous about your first pull request, fix a typo or add to documentation, or add to the readme, uh, you know, remove some white space, things like that. And these things are helpful, and they're a really great way to begin your open source journey, but an employer is not going to hire you because you fix a lot of typos, right? You have to actually submit really valuable uh, code. And so the first thing is you have to know how to code well enough to make a significant contribution. The second thing is you have to be able to communicate. I'm always surprised when I talk to open source maintainers and they tell me how much of their time they spent not just building things, but just talking to people between code reviews, between responding to people being mean to them on Twitter, uh, to them trying to get more people involved, to responding to issues. There's a lot of communication that needs to happen. So the stronger you are in your communication skills, the better off you'll be in that first open source contribution. And the third thing is time. Uh, we talk about open source as if it's free, and it is kind of free in terms of money, but it's definitely not free in terms of time. And if we think about the journey between that first open source contribution where you fix a typo all the way up to getting a really important PR merged, that's a lot of time that has to pass for you to make that significant contribution. The fourth one is probably pretty obvious. You need com a computer, or at least access to a computer. 
And the last one is internet, hopefully high-speed internet, so you can contribute often and make that a regular part of your routine. So if we think about open source as a class that you take in college, these five are like the prerequisites. Before you even make a contribution, you have to have these things before you walk in the door. So how do we get here? How do we get to a place where we can code, we can communicate, we've got time, we've got a computer, we've got internet? How did I get here? Let's talk about privilege. I was born in Ethiopia. I come from an upper middle class household in the United States. My parents are both pharmacists and we lived the American dream by the book. My father came when I, to the States when I was about one and then my mother and I followed him when I was almost three years old. We started in a really, really crappy one bedroom apartment in a not so great part of Washington DC. And then in middle school, we moved to a much nicer four bedroom townhouse in one of the richest counties in the United States. And then in high school, we moved to a five bedroom single family, beautiful home in one of the richest parts of the richest county in the United States. I didn't earn any of that. They gave that to me. So what happens when your parents have good jobs and provide that type of stability? And there's a study done in 2014 by the National Bureau of Economic Research that says, uh, called, Where is the Land of Opportunity? The Geography of Intergenerational Mobility in the United States. So if we look here, we can see on the x-axis, we have the parent household income. And on the y-axis, we have the mean child household income. And we see a correlation where the more money the parent makes, the more money the child is likely to make when they become an adult. And we see it kind of evens off at about a quarter million dollars, but I think at a quarter million dollars, you're probably okay. So how does this affect the likelihood of going to college? We have another awesome graph for you. We have on the x-axis, the parent income rank, on the right, the college quality rank, and on the left, the parent, the percent attending college at ages 18 to 21. And here we see a very similar correlation. The more the parent makes, the higher likelihood it is that the child goes to college in that age and the better quality the college is likely to be. And for me, what that meant is I went to a really, really great public school and I got to go there for free. I didn't have to pay tuition. I didn't have to go to private school to do that. And in my school, because it was in such a, a great part of the United States, I had a system of people who had very high academic standards. We were peer pressured not into doing drugs or partying, but to making sure we got top grades and making sure that we got into the best colleges. That was the pressure that I faced when I was in, uh, in school. College was not an option. It was an expectation. When I met people as an adult who decided not to go to college, I thought, you could do that? Didn't know, didn't know that was an option. And all of these positive side effects were made possible, not by anything I did or worked for, but by what my parents did and worked for. Next, let's talk about computer and internet access. I had my first computer with internet at age nine. I didn't know what to do with it, so I played uh, a lot of Oregon Trail, which is a really, really terrible game. Uh, and my mother forced me to learn how to touch type. And I don't know how she knew that that would be such an important skill, but I spent a lot of time with uh, Mavis Beacon, uh, who taught me a lot about typing and patience. In middle school and high school, I had an, um, access to an amazing computer lab where we had the latest technology, all of the, the best computers. We had Macs everywhere. We had the Adobe Creative Suite. I learned how to edit uh, audio and video and all these things at 13. Raise your hand if you know what an internet desert is. Raise them, raise them, raise them, raise them. Ah, oh, you guys are going to do so much learning today. So, internet desert is a section where you do not have access to wired broadband. And what that means is that you don't have access to internet speeds that are fast enough to do pretty basic things like uploading a photo or doing a video chat. And I work from home, so I spend a lot of time uh, doing meetings on video chat. So if I didn't have high-speed internet, I'd be in a lot of trouble. There are 11 million people in the US who don't have access to wired broadband. Now, if we look at where these people live, we will notice something very interesting. A 2016 FCC report called the Broadband Progress Report said that on average, the proportion of the population without internet access is highest in counties with the lowest median household income, the lowest population density, the highest rural population rate, and the highest poverty rate. And you can see that half of these factors have to do directly with money, with income. If we look at this on the worldwide scale, we'll see that as of 2015, only 46.4% of the world's population has access to internet, 
which means that more than half of the people in the world cannot make a pull request. That's a lot of people. So let's think, talk about higher education. I graduated from college with two degrees in English and psychology, which I use every single day. And if we look at the way Oh, okay, there we go. I guess I didn't like higher education. So, if we look at how higher education correlates with um, income and unemployment, we have this wonderful convenient graph right here. And we can see that the higher your degree, the more money you're likely to make, unless you have a doctoral degree. I don't know what's up with the PhD group. Uh, they're not doing as well as the others, but we see that correlation. And we see the inverse with unemployment. So the higher your degree, the less likely you are to be unemployed, unless you have a PhD. Hello, hello, hello. Okay. So besides the financial benefits of having a degree, let's talk about some of the other benefits. Now in the United States, for a four-year degree, the first two years are generally spent doing general studies, which is very liberal arts heavy which means there's a lot of written papers, school projects, presentations, things like that. Which means that at the end of those two years, you walk out with some very strong communication skills, whether you like it or not. And as we mentioned, communication skills are super important for that open source prerequisite list. Next category, health. I don't think too much about my health. I've got all my limbs, my senses, everything generally works most of the time. But not everyone has the benefits of being fully able-bodied. If we look at the number of people who are functionally deaf, we have 1 million in the US, 360 million in the world. Legally blind, 1.3 million in the US, 39 million in the world. Colorblind is much more common. We have 1 in 12 men and 1 in 200 women. And being able-bodied is not something that I've personally earned. And I don't have to worry about a lot of these issues. But if you do have to worry, what does that look like? I think the obvious one, especially for us as developers, is accessibility. I can't use the app that I want to use. Uh, you know, this website doesn't work for me, things like that. But another really big one is financial impact. Uh, there's the problem of just medical bills, but there's also lost wages if you have to take time off. So there's a huge stressor that happens just from the, the money aspect. And the last one, and this is one that I didn't appreciate until I had a really close friend who uh, had a lot of medical issues, is the emotional stress. It is really, really frustrating and heartbreaking and depressing to be stuck inside a body that won't let you do all the things that you want to do and be the person you want to be. Let's talk about money. My parents paid for my education. I sound like a brat, don't I? Oh. Which to me is probably my biggest achievement because getting your immigrant parents to pay for your English degree is very impressive. So I graduated debt free. Now student debt, especially in the US, is pretty common, so how big of a deal is this really? If we look at numbers, student debt in the US, we have 40 million people with 1.2 trillion US dollars uh, worth of student debt, which comes out to about 30,000 per person. That's a lot, that's a lot of money. If we compare it to other types of debt, we'll see that with the exception of a mortgage, more people, more money, we owe more money in student loans than in any other category. And this happened pretty recently. This happened as of 2010. But what impact does this have? If everybody has student debt, then does it really matter? Yes, yes it does. There was a survey where 52% of people strongly agreed or somewhat agreed with the statement, my need to pay student loan debt is hampering my ability to further my career. And this is something that I saw personally firsthand. I had many friends who had to take the first job they could get out of college, whether or not it was something they were interested in, whether it was in a field that they studied in, it really didn't matter. They had bills to pay and they had to start earning income as soon as possible. For me, the biggest thing is that I didn't have to get a job. I could take a two-week gig and hopefully it turned into a full-time job. I could take an internship that didn't really pay a lot, but maybe it'll lead to something bigger. I could take a few months off to explore and find myself. I could take a lot of chances. I could build a career. And this means that many years later, I could take a chance and I could learn to code and switch fields entirely. Yes, exactly. 
So back to that question, how did I get here? How did I get to a place where I can code, I have strong communication skills, I have internet, I have computers, I have financial stability to spend time on unpaid work like contributing to open source? I'm really, really lucky. And I think a lot of you are really lucky too. And people hate hearing that because we want to believe that we worked really hard and we did it by the skin of our teeth. And I used to be one of those people and I would tell my husband all the time, he's sitting right there by the way, raise your hand, raise your hand husband, there you go. <laughs> I always tell him I'm not going to do that and then I do it uh, and I used to tell my husband all the time I used to say I'm not lucky I worked really hard and he would go sure but you're also a little lucky and so I thought about that and I started doing a lot of research I read all these articles also known as tweets and I found that there's this tension between luck and hard work because all the celebrities the really famous, successful people will tell you, you got to work really hard to get to where you are. And no one really wanted to admit that luck had a part of it as well. And I work hard too, but here's the thing. A year ago, I used to work at Microsoft. I ran a program called Tech Jobs Academy. And the program was a technical training opportunity for unemployed and underemployed New Yorkers. And the idea was to take people who were really passionate, really excited, and just never got an opportunity, and to train them and give them a chance to start careers in tech. And so I had a classroom full of 25 people who were all very bright and really hardworking and weren't necessarily as successful as a lot of the developers that I know. I had one graduate in, in particular who was raising four kids on her own and she'd been wanting to get into tech for years. And she would read one book at a time and go to the library whenever she had a moment and take a course when it was available and slowly but surely was working her way up and developing her technical skills. So by the time that I went to Microsoft at 11 a.m. and rolled in all comfortable, she'd already raised and clothed four people. So it can't just be about hard work. I'm lucky that I didn't have to worry about money or my health or where my next meal was coming from. I had the exposure and the stability and the support early on in life so that later, as an adult, I could focus on my work. I was lucky first so that I could work hard later. And that's okay. It's totally okay to admit that luck played some role in your success. So what do we do? What do we do with this information? What do we do with our luck? We tend to solve problems that we personally experience. Has anyone seen Shark Tank? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Well, I love Shark Tank. So if you've seen one episode of Shark Tank, you've seen every episode of Shark Tank. Because it's the same story. It all goes something like this. I love to paint. I love painting with paintbrushes. When I paint, the paint gets on the paintbrushes, and then the paint dries, and then I can't use the paintbrush anymore. So I built this cover to cover the paintbrush so my paint stays wet and I can paint whenever I want. Can I have a million dollars? And that is an actual product that did get a ton of money. And it's all like that. It's all people, entrepreneurs, who say, I have this problem, this is really painful for me, I assume that other people also have this problem, can you give me money so that I can solve it? And it makes sense because we understand the problems we experience. We can empathize with them. We probably have a circle of friends who get together every Friday and drink and complain about how terrible these problems are. But if we only solve the problems that we personally experience, we leave everyone else behind. So one thing we can do is we can expand our problem pool. The more problems that we can understand that we're exposed to, the better we are able to share that luck and spread some of that around. And there are a few ways to do this. Number one is to follow people who are not like you. And it's really easy to do this on Twitter. Twitter gets a lot of hate for saying that you, you're kind of in your own bubble, but it's also really easy to escape that bubble. Follow people who don't speak the same language, who don't live in the same country, who don't code in the same languages that you do. Follow people who look differently, who believe different things. Half the people I follow on Twitter, I don't even like them. But I know that if I have them in my feed on a regular basis, that it exposes me to ideas that I don't have and reminds me that my opinion is not necessarily the most important opinion in the room. The second one that I love is to volunteer. It's really easy to read articles and say, oh, it really sucks for that person in that place at that time. But it's very different when you can sit next to someone and volunteer and help them and give them your time. You get to know them not just as a statistic, but as a real person and empathize with them on a real level. And the last one is to amplify voices. I mentioned three people at the very beginning of this talk who are doing really powerful things to make our industry a little bit better. 
it's really easy to just retweet them. The next time you have a conference, invite them to speak. If you have a job opening, recommend them. They're really easy, small ways that you can uh, support these people who are taking on that burden of making it a better place for all of us. So expand your pool, share your luck. Now, as we talk about luck and privilege, this might sound a bit like diversity. I hate the word diversity. It emphasizes our differences. It draws lines between us. It assumes that there is a normal and there is an other. And if we just get enough of the others in the room, then we're diverse, we're doing great. It's too easy to half-ass. I prefer inclusion, because inclusion requires you to always ask yourself, who am I leaving out? Whose voice, whose story is not being heard? Whose perspective are we not considering? Inclusion is a worthy and elusive goal. It demands that we care, that we empathize. It will outlast the latest diversity trend. It cannot be captured in a hashtag. It's easy to talk about women in tech and the truly pathetic number of people of color in our industry, but I worry that if we just focus on those two things, we forget everyone else. We forget about the single moms, the dads working three shifts to make ends meet, the people who wait for hours in line at the library to get access to a computer for just 30 minutes that day. When we make it our mission to include more voices and perspectives in tech, to not just build for others, but to build with others, we're all better off. And we can all be a little more lucky. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Saron. That was really, really amazing. I uh, really love sharing. Uh, can, can I ask you one thing, side question, yep. about your uh, book club? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. would, you, would you care to mention that? Sure. So I also do another podcast uh, with one of my really good friends. Yet um, another? <laughs> yet another, yes. Called the Ruby Book Club Podcast. And so for one hour each week, we read a section of a Ruby book, and then we discuss it online. So it's our way of making sure that we actually, you know, we, we have programming books, and we tell ourselves we're going to read them, and we never really do. So this is our way of making sure that we read them. So we've read, uh, I think we're on our fourth book. We're reading Ruby Under a Microscope by uh, Pat Shaughnessy, and it's, I think we're halfway through it. It's really, really good. So definitely encourage you to check that it's out. It's a tough book. It's a, it, yes, it is. It really is. <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. It's tough, but good. Yeah. Any questions on the talk? or? Or just, you know, Saron in general. Please, Nick. Um, I, I understand this talk was probably um, originally put together maybe with the U.S. audience in mind. Yes. And as someone from America and, and from a place that until very recently was part of the internet desert, um, mm -hmm. literally from the opening slide, I anticipated the thrust of the talk because I feel like this is the conversation I also have with people all mm -hmm. the time. I grew up on food stamps in a town of 200 people in Maine yeah. and also had every single thing fall my way to allow me to get a higher education. Um, what, in, in urban environments, the, the avenues for people to get into tech are very different than they are in rural environments. Mm -hmm. Have you seen efforts or organizations that have been successful? And clearly a top-down solution is not coming anytime soon given the, the climate in America. Are, are there organizations that succeed from the bottom up and what are the key uh, concepts behind those organizations that make them successful? Yeah, oh, that's a really good question. Um, there's one organization I can think of that's US-based called Tech Hire, and it is an initiative that is part of the nonprofit called Opportunity at Work. And they've actually made a very concerted effort to focus on rural programs, because that's the problem that I get as well. I get people who say, I want to start a Code Navy meetup, but there's not a lot of sponsors in my area, there's not a lot of literally places to meet. Uh, and it's really hard to support those locations. And Tech Hire has really, really tried to build a community in places that aren't necessarily tech hubs and to connect them with the resources they have. Um, so from my understanding, they try to focus on uh, or try to connect they try to first create a community, so finding local leaders, finding out what are the tech employers there, what are the universities there, uh, what are the places that might sponsor and support. And they try to do, um, I want to say it's like monthly phone calls. Uh, and I don't know if they specifically, I think they do some financial support as well, but a lot of it is just figuring out what are the resources that exist and how can we check in and funnel um, other in-kind donations from other areas into that location. So that's definitely one that's making a lot of work in that. That's a really good question. U.S. focused. <laughs> Sorry. Any any other questions or even just opinions on like uh, how we are lucky here in Malaysia? 
Cedric, please. Hey, thanks a lot for speaking so, so much about privilege. I think I, I, well, I personally haven't gotten such conversations a lot around here because the, and the concept of privilege, I guess, is not as in depth as when I was in the States. Mm -hmm. I would like to have more conversations like this with my team. How, well, what, what angle can I, you know, uh, try you know, mm. to practice it? Because I've had, yeah. I, I've spoken to my talent team a lot about equality and how it needs to be pursued actively, as opposed to just saying that it's always merit and saying it's flat. Mm. But you need to first as acknowledge privilege and understand that equality means equality in opportunities, not necessarily just pure merit or in that sense. So yeah, it, well, what's a good composition to initiate that? Yeah, oh, that's a, you guys are asking good questions. Um, so that one, I think it's important to find moments where maybe there is an underlying privilege that people don't think about. So for example, um, if you have a job application, right? Looking at your job application, instead of saying, you know, do I have all my criteria, thinking, is there anything in here that might turn somebody off? If I were a woman and I read this, is there anything that might turn me off? If I'm US-based and I'm not hiring from a US-based audience, there's something here that might turn me off. If I am an alt, that's one thing huge as well as ageism is huge in tech. I get a ton of people in our community who are much older trying to break into tech and they say like, no one will give me an internship or an apprenticeship because I'm, they think I'm too old to do a good job. So if I read that job description, is there something here that for someone who is 50 and getting started might turn them off? Um, so I think that finding opportunities like job descriptions um, for me, as, because I run a conference, one thing that I do is I read, um, I, I look at the CFP process and I try to ask myself, if I'm a first time speaker, is there something here that would scare me? If I'm uh, you know, a, a person of color, is something here that might kind of be coded in a certain language that I, I may not think about? So what I try to do is I kind of, I keep a running list of all the people who are not like me and I say to myself, if I am this person, what might be uncomfortable? What might turn me off that I may not see? And then making sure to have people from those communities look at it too. So to give you another example, um, my, my conference, Codeland, one thing that I didn't realize that I did until after it was too late was I didn't do a good job of catering to parents. I'm not a parent, I don't have kids, most of my friends don't have kids, so I didn't think about what does this conference look like for someone who has a child and wants to bring their child to the conference. And so what I'm gonna do this year is I'm gonna make sure that my programming committee is made of people who have parents and I'm gonna ask them explicitly, as a mom, as a dad, is there anything here that looks a little funny to you? So finding those opportunities and saying who may be uncomfortable, who, who may be turned off, and seeing how you can adjust for that. Does that help? That really does help. One last question before. Come on. I know some of you by name. I'll start calling out. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I have a question. <laughs> um, how to identify your bias and how to work with your biases? How to identify and work your bias. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think that, I'm trying to think from my personal experience. Okay, so with the conference again, there were definitely a list of groups of people that I know that I did not think about because I don't, either I don't identify as that or I don't know people in my circle as that. So for me, listening to people's feedback was important. Um, and I think making sure, so that's the thing, I think that with feedback, a lot of times we say, if you have feedback, come find me. That's not helpful. No one's gonna go out of their way to give you feedback. So for our conference, what we did was, before anyone was allowed to leave on the last day, I gave everyone a physical uh, you know, a, like scorecard. It was 10 questions, score out from one to 10. Um, and I gave everyone a card and I did like raffle prizes to make sure people actually filled it out. And I learned a lot from that. I read every single one, I put it in a spreadsheet, I spent like, a ridiculous amount of hours going through every single thing and saying, oh my goodness, I totally didn't think about this. I didn't think about the fact that if you have a conference for, we were based in New York City, so um, we had a conference that started, I think it was at eight o'clock, which meant that people had to book a hotel the night before, but if we had started at 10 o'clock, they could have driven that morning, which would have saved them a lot of money, right? Like that's something I totally didn't think about until someone said so. So I think that making sure you have consistent, you're consistently asking for feedback and making it very, very, very easy, even if it's more work for you, really easy for them is the best way. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, when I mentioned like expanding your problem pool, finding people who are not like you, I'm always looking at my community and thinking, what biases do I see? So for my podcast, um, I'm very much in the Ruby community. All my friends are Rubyists. 
we were very Ruby heavy for the first like 50 episodes. And I, and I looked at my podcast and I thought, oh crap, these are all Rubyists. Like I'm leaving out all the other programming languages, but I can't do that. So kind of re-examining and seeing like, are there any patterns here? Are there things that everyone has, you know, that's, that's um, the same? And if it is, why is that? Is that because my friends are all this type of person? Is it because my work is this type of person? And then like always asking yourself that question and then finding ways to introduce variety into your life. I know there is also a set of tests made by Stanford. Mm -hmm. The set of tests that showed you two, two new pictures one by one and ask you to identify the picture with the selection of words on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Then you answer the question and at the end of the test you have your bias picture so you can mm -hmm. work with that. Yeah. It gives you like you often need to define like man or like someone uh, more likely to use any like good like, uh, like good traits or something mm -hmm. like that. So you can work with that. I can send you that. Yeah. That would be great. Thank, Thank you so much. much. We really appreciate Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.